Welcome to episode three of Engineering Success with our special guest, Ian Pegram. Ian is on the board of directors for Bride and Wood, a company of designers, architects and engineers in the pursuit of value for the built environment. Having joined Bride and Wood in 2013, Ian is responsible for the management of the building services team. He retains a hands-on approach to project works and retains responsibility for the design, construction and commissioning for a wide range of projects. He has extensive experience across a number of sectors including healthcare, cultural and heritage and sports projects. Ian's specialist discipline is electrical engineering, but he's built up a considerable cross-disciplinary knowledge whilst leading many large and complex engineering projects around the world. Hi Ian, and welcome to Engineering Success. Can we start uh, at the beginning of your career? Uh, how did you first get uh, involved in the engineering industry, and who was the first company you worked for? Great, well thank you very much for asking me to be part of this. Um, I started having left school with almost no qualifications whatsoever. Um, I was ill in the last year of my school year and um, as a consequence was forced to leave school and decided that uh, the only thing I knew what to do was to become an apprentice electrician. And there was a large electrical contracting firm in St Albans, which is where I lived at the time. Um, and I went to become an apprentice electrician with them. And I um, went to college a day a week over a three-year period, um, and, dur um, and during the other periods, I was working as a, you know, pulling at cables, crawling around in lofts, etc., um, and soon realised that, um, Jamie can see, I'm not the right size to be crawling around <laughs> in lofts, and soon realised that that wasn't the right career for me. So, um, having um, done the apprenticeship for three years. I left with some quite good qualifications, some craft um, city and guilds qualifications, and went to go and work for a consulting engineering practice um, called Oscar Fabers, who are now called AECOM. Um, I joined as a trainee electrical engineer, um, and I was immediately put to work with a senior engineer doing very crude, basic electrical calculations etc, etc. Um, and then I was following a part-time formal qualification route where I did my ONC, um, Ordinary National Certificates, over two years, and then did my HNC over part-time two years again. Then I did my degree um, over a four-year part-time period, which um, was an enormous amount of time to be studying part-time at college. So I was, but the benefit was that I was earning while I was learning. So, and my career was progressing at the same time. So having joined Oscar Fabers in 1989 as a trainee electrical engineer, by the time I graduated in 2007, I was, I was a senior electrical engineer at Oscar Fabers. And, um, it was just fantastic. You know, I was very lucky through that period, through the Oscar, early Oscar Faber period, where I got to work on some awesome projects. Um, the uh, the best project and probably the most notable project was the Windsor Castle fire restoration. Um, so that in 1993, for those of you that won't remember or don't know, <laughs> Windsor Castle burnt down um, and Oscar Fabers were employed to do the re a lot of the redesign work. And I guess it was right time, right place. Um, and I was the electrical design engineer working with some amazing architects working in the rural household, um, redesigning that project. And um, I was there for a number of years. Um, and it was really the making of me, I would suggest that project was. You know, it exposed me to all sorts of people that I would never normally um, get to talk to, communicate with. Um, it exposed me to situations that, you know, some uncomfortable that, um, and, you know, working to tight budgets, working with awkward people, difficult people, equally some fantastic people. It was just really interesting. Um, yeah. And then um, I, at the end of that project, 
um, I was very fortunate that that coincided with the commencement of the PFI initiative, private um, finance initiative initiative, where the government had decided that they needed to invest in hospitals. Um, and there was an, quite an enormous um, funding process put in place, and a slightly different funding process put in place, where the private industry was encouraged to design and build a large number of hospitals around the UK. And I was introduced to a healthcare team at Oscar Fabers in, those, in that time. And, you know, there was two of us at that time starting to consider how we bit, helped to bid these ho large hospital schemes. And ultimately, 10 years later, there was a team of 50 of us um, designing hospitals, which I was, because I was a founding member of that team, I was leading. And it was, and it led on to all sorts of fantastic opportunities. So that was really, well, that's a bit of a snapshot of sort of early days of my career, I'm yeah. afraid, but I just, um, so that I would say that Windsor Castle really broke my career and then, um, or made my career, I should say. And then um, the hospitals, um, we became, you know, the team became highly specialised in delivering hospital healthcare schemes, which from a technical point of view are, are awesome and just fantastic schemes to be working on. Yeah, yeah. So who's been your biggest inspiration? Well, last, more recently in my career, I worked for a company called Arup, um, a global engineering business, fantastic company. And I am, um, and I was very, very fortunate enough to work with an architect called Renzo Piano, yeah. who um, he designed the Shard in London. He's designed all sorts of iconic buildings around the world. And I was working with him and his team on a number of projects. And for me, the most notable being the Stavros Niarchos Foundation in Athens, which was, in every sense of the word, awesome. Yeah. yeah I yeah. mean, truly awesome. It's yeah. the, it's actually the, it's finished, and it's the Greek National Opera House and the Greek National Library yeah. set in enormous parkland. Yeah. And if you ever get an opportunity, I would suggest that you go and look <laughs> at a website and go and look at images of the of the scheme. It is just breathtaking. Yeah. And um, I was lucky enough to see the see through the design stage of it. I led the Arup team through that project, right. um, and I left Arup before the actual project was finished. Um, but I was lucky enough to take my family back for one of the opening events quite recently um, in the one last year, um, and went to see a lot of my old friends out there. So it was, it was yeah. absolutely brilliant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so Renzo Piano, I would argue, is probably my biggest influence, just because. It's just lovely to see this yeah. creativity, and it, it's massively impressive to see. Yes, yeah. So, you know, we know a lot of leaders have daily uh, habits. Uh, do you have any daily rituals that you that you do, weekly rituals? Or? I like to have my normal commute to work, like everyone else has their commute, <laughs> which I suppose is a habit, because it's a necessary habit. Yeah. But I um, I wouldn't say I necessarily, I'm, well, I'm not conscious. Nobody's ever told me of any dreadful habits, good habits or bad habits. Right. Um, the thing I am very, very fussy about, though, is my use of the English language in terms of written English. Right. Um, and I forever critique others' words, and I'm guilty. I've had dreadful with a red pen, get my <laughs> red pen out, and I, criti I critique everybody's work. Right. Um, it's just me. That's just in me. That's part yeah, of yeah, me, yeah. and I can't help it, unfortunately. Yeah. So what attributes do you need to be on the board of directors for Bride and Wood? Um... When I first started work, I, th I always thought that directors were intimidating people and, you know, scary people and all of those things. And I, the reality is that I feel quite the opposite. Of, you know, I'm, I'm a board director at Bride and Wood, so I have responsibility for certain aspects of, of this business. Um, and I think, genuinely, I think that being, feeling that I'm part of a team, for me, is really important. So I don't sit in an office, I sit... I actually, at the moment, I sit next to one of our graduate engineers mm. um, just because I would like, I'd rather sort of implant myself in amongst the team yeah. um, and just feel part of it. So I think strong communication is part of it and people, me communicating with people, but also people feeling comfortable to communicate to me. Yeah. And if that, I, there are always people that say, well, you're blurring lines between friendship and business, mm. but I think they're, they're very linked. I think you're, you spend too long at work to be unhappy. Yes. And I think you're only happy when you're with your friends. Yeah. 
And so I, I strongly believe that I form, I, I try to form friendships with people that I work with. Yeah. And, you know, I only work with my friends. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So what challenges do you face on a weekly basis? Um, making sure that people are busy and properly employed doing the work that interests them and just keeping keeping the team motivated and going that's probably one of my biggest challenges okay so I also I, I primarily worry about staff I worry about people that's um, that's what I worry about you know I the money if people are happy and we're doing good work the money the financial side of the business, I'd like to say we'll sort itself out, but I but it it needs limited amounts of intervention. You know, if people are happy, that's what it's all about in the industry that that we work in. You know, the consulting, engineering business, and the architectural business. It's you know it, we get paid by the hour, and as long as we're using our hours efficiently, that's that. You know, that looks after itself. You know, I'm very passionate about um, professional development in among, in the team. And so I make sure that everybody um, is being trained properly um, uh, to try and achieve that. We set up um, a tra- formal training, credit training program with the Chartered Institute of Building Services Engineers. We set that up three years ago, and we now have some people coming through who are becoming chartered as a direct consequence of that. That that's a challenge to keep that rolling, to keep again to keep people motivated. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that that's really the sort of what the, the challenges I face. You know, I could say that I worry about money all the time, but I don't, <laughs> no. to be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what would your number one advice be for somebody starting a career in engineering? Well, I've got lots of advice, um, but I think I don't think I can necessarily pin it down to one piece of advice. I mean, at engineering, well, certainly the part of engineering that I work in is a fast-moving technological industry for many many years it wasn't you know it was apply standard physics and you would come up with an answer and that's the answer that ended up on on the page now it's a much more dynamic place to be Um, so if you're interested in you know forever challenging forever diversifying um, you know innovating and all of those things I think engineering is a great place to be um, you know, it's not a static industry at all. You know, there's the, the new um, computer technologies, new software out there that just allows you to, to ask ask different questions that you've ever ever been able to ask before, questions that you didn't know existed but are very relevant. You know, dynamic um, simulations that can be done on buildings now, it, incredible stuff. Um, BIM, Building Information Modeling, is just the most amazing thing um, to get involved with at the moment that's a career in its own right so sorry to go back to the question there's not one piece <laughs> of advice there's it's just a fantastic place to be i think yeah yeah, yeah. so we all know there's a, a skill shortage uh, in engineering at the minute whatever discipline there seems to be a skill shortage um why do you feel that, that there is a shortage in in engineering i think the um engineering industry is always um suffered from there not being enough relevant um, engineering courses um, provided. I don't think that it's perceived to be um, a a sort of glamorous industry, if you like. You know, architecture, for example, is always, you know, if you're at school, everybody said, what would you like to be at school? You know, you're an architect or, you know, something, a doctor or or a lawyer or some of those sort of well-known careers, you know, in my case, a building services engineer isn't something you'd necessarily immediately aspire to simply because I didn't understand what it was. Um, I think that that now having existed in the industry, it's a fantastic thing to be doing. Um, but I think it's it's down to perception, it's down to credibility, and it's it's up to me, I suppose, and others in my position to try and sort of you know raise the profile of it. But I think it's a lot of it's down to courses and down to the way that it's, you know, that, that there's an, not an awareness of it at the very, very junior ranks and within schools. So do you feel we could promote the industry better? Definitely. At, at every level? Most definitely. There's, there, there's, no, there's no two ways about it. I mean, I, I actually think that the, that the latest round of um, apprenticeships, you know, the sort of latest 
initiative and mm. the impetus that's trying to, or the momentum that the, the government are trying to get with apprenticeships is helping, actually. Um, we have started up an apprenticeship scheme yeah. um, at Brighton Woods. Um, you know, we decided that we, you know, the market is saturated. There's, there is a skill shortage. The market is saturated. And we needed to look elsewhere and we needed to fill our, our business, you know, from the bottom. And so, um, and, and so, you know, we've started an apprenticeship scheme, but we started, we've, we've got an apprenticeship called Digital Delivery Apprenticeship, right. where we have um, decided that, you know, what people coming out of school do know how to do is to game. You know, they're all, they're all gamers. <laughs> yeah. Um, and a lot of the design software that we use is basically, you know, gaming um, looking software. Yeah, you know, yeah. it, it all works in a 3D environment, a very <laughs> visual environment. And so, you know, we're trying to sort of appeal. And I think it, it that, that helps the perception of our industry. And so, you know, we've successfully taken on a number of apprenticeships, apprentices and um, who are doing great things. And learning engineering along the way, and they're learning learning engineering while they're doing what they're good at. Yeah, and enjoying it. Enjoying yeah, yeah, it, loving yeah, it. Yeah. So it's that's been a good initiative, and hopefully, you know, the apprenticeship scheme will bring a new and a different type of person into our industry. That's that's what I'm hoping. Yeah. Yeah. So, what are the biggest changes you've seen in your career? Um, the level of automation, without a doubt. The level of you know, when I first started, CAD was in its infancy. Mm. There was a single computer in the corner of the office, um, smoke-filled office, <laughs> um, and there was one computer with a green screen in the corner of the office, and that, and that was it. And then everyone sat and wrote letters. And, um, and we had a tracing department and all of those things. And just technology has moved on, and automation in our industry is now very, very powerful. You know, we've got very powerful computers and we're now pushing the boundaries of what those computers can do um, as I said earlier the level of analysis that we're doing on on our computers is, is amazing you know we have people in-house who are writing software they don't really they don't understand necessarily how to build a building or how to design a building but they're writing software that is fantastically useful for us yeah so you know it's encouraging a lot of R&D and a lot of innovation a lot of deep thinking um, and so I think that there, I think I, I don't think it's anything more complicated than just innovation yeah. and um, and automation that, that's coming, that's that's arriving in our industry. So what about the next five to ten years? Then do you yeah. think that's only going to get better, and more I think, complex? I think that BIM, as I, I I mentioned BIM earlier, BIM is the sort of buzzword around our industry. Mm. Um, I'm very fortunate that the firm that I that I work for um, are innovators in BIM. Um, you know, government has has uh, are driving a lot of the BIM standards across our industry, and that that can only lead to good things, and that can only lead to you know clever people doing clever things, designing buildings. And one of the things that BIM allows us to do, for example, it you know people look at a BIM model. I mean, you will have all seen BIM models if you scan through any any clever companies. Um, architectural or engineering companies' websites, you'll see beautiful 3D images of buildings. They're, they would have come out of BIM models. And, um, but the level of intelligence that sit behind those BIM models, you know, every item that is drawn has intelligence, it has cost data, it has engineering parameters associated with it. And it's just, and, and, and what you can do with that data is just amazing. And so I think that that, We'll just get more and more dynamic, more and more powerful as the years go on. Yeah. So, how do you keep yourself motivated? Um, oh, that's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 I am. I've always been self-motivated. I've always been self-driven. Yeah. Um, you know, my wife actually asked me. Um, you know, why don't you just go and work on a golf course? You know, you <laughs> they see much more of me, and I'd say, well. If I went to work on a golf course, within a week I'd be wanting to run the golf course, <laughs> and that's just my problem. I'm um, I'm ambitious. I'm forever ambitious, yeah. um, but I am, um, you know, I keep myself motivated because I'm keen and, you know, I, I can't work in a place that I'm not interested in. Yeah. So I'm interested in what I do. I'm interested in the people I work with, and that keeps me busy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So obviously, whatever level you're at, it's 
you know, it's important to continually develop yourself. What do you do to develop yourself in yeah. the position you're in? Yeah, good question. Um, there's never enough time to sort of take myself off onto sort of long courses and all sorts of things like that. So um, one of the things that I that I do do is um, I've now taken on the role of being the board director responsible for human resources in our, in our company. Um, and that means that I've had to learn a new skill set. So I've done some self-learning. Um, I've uh, we've employed a consultant, an HR consultant that I that I speak to, and they give me tuition. So I do a lot of that. Um, I do CPD, continual professional development, and I I have to do that as part of um, my chartership requirements and as part of my um, membership of at the institutes. So I do a lot of CPD whether that be by visiting manufacturers or manufacturers coming in to speak to us. Um, I do a lot of reading. I do a lot, um, a lot of subject re- matter reading. I do deliver some presentations. And obviously, before you do a presentation, you always have to do some swatting up and make sure you're an absolute subject matter expert. So there's, there's quite a lot of that to do. Um, and I... And I read management books. Um, I quite enjoy reading sort of management theory. I don't always believe it or I don't always take their advice, but I quite enjoy understanding how other people manage things and manage people. Yeah. So a, a wide range of, yeah, of yeah. stuff. Yeah. But I'm I but the overall theme is I keep myself busy. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not one for sitting down. If I sit in front of the television I fall asleep. <laughs> so, so I do so I do every, anything but that. Yeah. So what attributes do you think are essential for success from starting your uh, journey in your career to, to say where you are now? What what general attributes do you think are required from an individual? Well, I you know, whether this is the norm or whether this is whether this is official, I don't know. But I've I've, I've always um, prided myself in the communication. Um, And so that's definitely an attribute, be an effective communicator. Um, As I said earlier, you know, I I only work with my friends and I make sure that that that's true. And that and I think that's an attribute. I I genuinely believe that to be so. Um, I'm always seeking to do things better and more efficiently. And that's part of the actual business ethos of this particular company that I work for. So Brian and Wood. So, you know, we're always looking to do things more efficiently and better and be smarter than our neighbours. Mm-hmm. So, so you know, we need to be the cleverest person in the room or else we don't get the next job. And so that's, that, that, that's always, um, I think that's an attribute as well, that, you know, we're always seeking to be better than, than our competition. Yeah. And so, yeah, probably that's it, really. I, yeah. I, I think it's fairly simple. Yeah, yeah. So have you had any mentors? that have helped you along your journey? Yeah. I mean, in Brydenwood, I have a person that um, I will always go to if I'm in doubt. Yeah. I will go and speak to them, and they will generally sort of give me some impartial advice or give me the nod <laughs> or, or, or shake their head. or, or uh, And, you know, no words need to necessarily be exchanged, but I, but I generally take their advice. Again, because of the communication that I try to encourage in the team, a lot of people rely on my advice, so... You know, I, I spend a lot of my day talking to people, um, and so if they have a problem, you know, we can deal with it before it becomes a real problem, or if the, if there's an issue, it's dealt with before it becomes a major issue. Um, and so, you know, I'd like to think that I mentor people. I professionally mentor people as part of our training scheme. Yeah. I am a I'm an official mentor for that, um, but. My old boss, when I was at um, Oscar Faber's, my old boss, who was a board director at, um, at Oscar Faber's, he was a great man and he would al- always, always find the time for me. And I think that's, and always listen and always communicate with me. And I think that that, you know, that guiding principle has always stood me in good stead. And that's what I've tried to follow, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, final question, Ian. What does the future hold for you? Not a clue. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I you know, the, the part of being in business is, to me, is growing a business, you know, is, is, is part of, and so we are, we're actively trying to um, grow, um, not just for the sake of growth, but, you know, positive growth. Um, 
at Brighton Wood, so I would like to be part of the, the assistance in helping Brighton Wood to grow, um, to become even more successful. You know, that's where the fun is. I've had to be part of, you know, redundancy programs in the past and all of those things, and they're not pleasant places to be. So, you know, growing something, being part of something successful is is fantastic. Um, but I never really don't I don't don't really think about more yeah. than the week ahead. Really, <laughs> I, I you know I, I look at my diary at the beginning of the week and I'm and I look what's going on. Yeah. And I've generally got a busy week and that sort of heads down for the week and right. get through to the weekend and. Um, but no, I, I, I foresee that we will, Bride and Wood will continue to grow, and I hope that I continue to grow within Bride and Wood. Yeah. Um, you know, in terms of my career ambitions, I've met my career ambitions. I always, I said earlier about wanting to run the golf course, I've always wanted, <laughs> um, I've always wanted to be a director yeah. um, of a company. You know, it's always been an ambition of mine. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I've, I've met, be lucky enough to meet that objective um but you should never sit back and just think right i've made it now um and so i would say that i'm probably you know being a director is probably one of the most challenging roles i've ever had um without a doubt it's not one you know the company that we're in does that, that brian and we don't allow us just to sit still and just sit there and sit in a boardroom you know if that's not how it rolls yeah. so um I don't really, to be honest, I don't really think what the future holds for me other than right. I just like to be part of it, whatever, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you just take it on. Yeah, yeah. Whatever comes at you. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you, Ian, for your time. It's been a pleasure to have you on the podcast today, uh, and I hope we speak again in the future. Yeah, thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Join us next time on Engineering Success for more insights from successful and inspirational leaders in the engineering and construction industries. for you to subscribe to the show and please leave comments and feedback on the website. Have an amazing week and see you next time on Engineering Success.